Music is out of the ordinary palette. And what we were looking for were some of our amazing artists who have very colorful palettes, but they don't use paint. They use other materials to create their works of art. So um, last week was an all-guy panel. Today we have the all-girl panel. So girl power. So um, I will start by introducing. My name is Susan. My husband Jake and I are the owners of the Celebration of Fine Art and we have an amazing team that we always want to thank uh, for helping us make all this happen and for all the wonderful artists. So first I'm going to I'm going to say it just right. This is Mimi Damwauer. And Mimi, this is your second year. I'll, I'll let you say it, but Mimi is joining us. She, she lives here now. She came from Chicago. And right next to her we have Aileen Frick who lives here in Phoenix. And um, yeah, both Chicago natives, right? And then we have Kathleen Hope who lives in Fountain Hills by way of Minnesota. And then we have the wonderful Mel, Marilyn, but we call her Mel from Montana, but we get to have her here the three months out of the year. So we're super happy to have this great panel. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun discovering their unique um, materials that they use, but I've introduced your name, but just take a moment to let people know just a little bit about you and maybe how long you've been in the show and what inspired you to use your material as your palette. So I'm going to start with you. Hi, so glad to see you all here. Um, I'm Mimi, and it is my second year here. I love being here. It's a magical show. Um, I actually use material for my material. I'm a sewer, and um, I was told that I'm the first person who ever had a sewing machine here at the show. <laughs> so I'm really proud of that, coming from him back old school. Um, I started sewing when I was nine years old. My mom was an expert seamstress. I am not. I have a very wobbly style, and it works for me. Um, I sewed when I was nine years old. I was sewing clothes initially, so my mom said I could not have a credit card from my father, and I had to learn how to make clothes if I wanted to have a wardrobe. So I would stay up and sew a new outfit in junior high and high school. I, luckily, nothing fell apart while I was wearing it. But I was very lucky. I was. I was definitely daring at times with that, but um, I started, uh, you know, what main inspiration really, besides my mother and my sisters who also, um, I watched CNN every Sunday with my mom at that age, and Elsa Clinch had a show about the pro about runways from Paris and New York, if you remember, and I would sit there and I would sketch clothes from the Paris runway uh, when I was nine years old, and I would try to create those. Another inspiration was Charlie's Angels. <laughs> so high, low, and low, low. Uh, the clothes were kind of cool back then. So, um, and so I've been sewing forever, and it's changed over time, which I'll be able to tell you more about later. different and 
I love it because it tells stories that I can't even imagine. Um, and each piece is unique. Um, it's too hard to tell in just a short period of time. Um, but it's just wonderful, and, and I just love it. And we'll have you share a little bit more about your how to's in a minute. I now save all my cool magazines, <laughs> especially the art magazines that I, I have a wonderful person I can give them to instead of filling a dumpster or laying them on my shelf for 10 years. So thank you for that. I am Kathleen Hope, and I've been at the show now five years. And um, every year it's, it's just fantastic because I get to meet new people and see same people and it's one same collectors, different collectors, it's, it's awesome. Um, I moved here about nine years ago from Minneapolis and when I was in Minneapolis I was basically a collage mixed media artist and I was always looking for that something. Um, I, I enjoyed mixed media but nothing quite clicked for me and therefore I wasn't really able to come up with the body of work like <laughs> Aileen was talking about. Um, you know, sometimes as artists we need to really define our style and if you can't connect with the medium, it's really, really hard to get a handle on your subject matter and kind of where your ideas go. And so. Nothing was connecting with me until I moved here. And how I started with cement, which this is one, one of my pieces, it's basically, um, it's an overlay cement on, on wood panel. Um, when I moved here, you know, living in Minneapolis, I really hate winter. And <laughs> I had to stay there uh, for good reason, my son. Uh, so when he graduated from high school, I seriously, the day after, my van was packed and I knew I was coming to Arizona. <laughs> I didn't have a job because I was self-employed in Minneapolis. I, was, uh, I specialized in uh, color psychology and uh, interior design and I did art as well. I literally had my van packed. I left on January 12th, nine years ago. I'll never forget it because it was about 20 below zero. I thought, I'm never coming back here. <laughs> so, so, so I came here and um, we rented for about a year and, and we finally bought a home. And you know, every night I would just sit outside and I was just so happy I wasn't getting attacked by mosquitoes or um, humidity and it was so nice. And, and I just kept looking around and because I was an artist, I'm like, you know, I want, when I'm sitting outside, I want a piece of art to, be outside. I want to look at art outside. So I thought, well, what could I do? Because you have to take into consideration the Arizona sun, which does damage, and also winters. And so cement, after I doing a lot of research, cement was really the only option. So with that being in mind, I do outdoor, outdoor art as well, which is in the courtyard. So I started just for a personal want making a piece for my outdoor patio and playing with cement and I just loved it. I It's just endless possibilities. So for two years I just basically made my outdoor art and then uh, because I'm a gallery artist I had to figure out a way how I could formulate it to go on wood and because I sell these in galleries so that's basically how I got started in cement, was just a personal want. And I think that sometimes happens in art, is sometimes the more you try, the harder it is to, to push, you know, to find out what you really want. And if you just let it be, it just, it just comes to you. And that's really what happened to me. Awesome. And now your tagline is fluid in cement. Yes. Oh, and by the way, yes. My tagline is fluent in cement. I only speak cement and English, that's it. That's all I do. I'm Mel Evans, or Marilyn, and I do the baskets around the corner by the office. 
And I've been doing this show 22 years. And yeah. yeah, long time. And the work has changed significantly in that time. They used to be very functional, very soft colored, and, and um, they've just evolved over time with the different commissions we've gotten and different niches to fill. And so they've gotten wilder. So the colors are bright and vibrant for the most part, are rich and uh, earthen often. And um, I dye all of that material. It's all dyed with uh, powders that I use. I order powders and then I mix them wildly to create shades. And I don't duplicate shades very well. I don't care to. I just make new and keep them coming. And and working with the willow, um, it's a it's always my bones of each piece is the willow, and we gather that in Montana. And it's always flexible and wonderful, and so each piece has a life of its own, and I have no plan. I just get started, and that's what happens. But my husband weaves with me, and uh, he does at least 50% of the work there, and um, he's really good. He doesn't take any instruction, <laughs> which is a problem. But I can fix that. I have my way with his things when, I, when he's doing He doesn't always know. <laughs> but anyway, it's just really been fun doing this show for so long and, and watching the work grow and change. It's just been a blast. So if you look in the program, the little... Um, thumbprint, thumbnail image next to this talk is of Mel in her home studio, which a few years ago, Jake and I had the privilege of traveling up to see Bill and Mel in their home studio, and it was just the most beautiful thing. She has all these five-gallon buckets of beautiful <laughs> dye that she's made from her powder and, and water mixture, and she'll soak the willow reed in there until it absorbs the color the way she wants. So I snapped a picture of her standing, similar to what she has here with her, her rattan. Yeah, um, all in the rack. Yeah. yeah, and it was like, oh, it's like Christmas. So um, so that was really, really magical to see that. And um, it is, your husband talks about the way the two of you weave together, but you are the color specialist. Yeah, and I really do that part, and, and but we both um, weave, but he also does all the woodwork for the most part. I attach the pieces, but um, he's a maestro that way. He's really good, uh, but I am the color person, yeah. It's just chaos in the basement, or, you know, as all studios are, but um, it's kind of fun. Have you always been into color? Yeah, I used to always um, either um, needlework of some kind, embroidery. My mother always put something in our hands. It was a lot of needlepoint and beadwork, of course. I sell some of that. And, and uh, yeah, somehow it's just gotten more vibrant, more fun, and more, a better sense. As you use color all the time, don't you find that your sense of color just grows? And, and it's just exciting putting strange things together. Great combination. Uh, yeah, and sometimes the things you think will be crazy end up being the most magnetic to the people who come to see, see our work. And, uh, so there's there's a lot of form and function, too, along with the color. Um, so I'm going to come back to Mimi, and you have some samples, and I will be your Vanna and hold up anything you wish me to hold up. But, so you evolved from clothing into, hey, I'm going to be an artist, and this is my palette, so tell us about it. I was, when I lived in Chicago, I actually was a special event planner. I planned um, parties for nightclubs that I worked for, but I always did my sewing on the side. Yeah, I can help you plan a Christmas party. Um, <laughs> but um, I always was drawn to sewing. I painted furniture, and I, yeah, so this is, I dye my fabrics as well. We probably buy the same powder dyes, but I learned how to mix colors in fourth grade. That is the basis of my business. Everything happened to me that was important in fourth grade. Yeah. I realized. <laughs> but I, I lived in Toledo, Ohio. That's where I grew up. And the Toledo Museum of Art is one of the best in the country. And they picked a couple kids from every grade from several different schools and sent us to art lessons Saturday mornings. 
and I learned how to mix colors. I learned my primary and secondary colors, and honestly, I can, you know, I call my sister sometimes, I'm like, how do you make olive again? She's like, yellow with a touch of black. I'm like, okay. So, but I pretty much know it's something that was there, and I luckily had a chance to play around with it. So when I dye fabric, I learned initially from eight colors how to make about a thousand. So I've created a recipe book for myself because I do work with a lot of interior designers or people for a special space and they want this shade of brown and I can do it pretty close. It'll be an original, but it'll be close. So when I dye my blues, I dye 40 shades of blue. I want every color in the crayon box. I need every shade to play with. So I'll, this is how I work. I dye cotton muslin and it almost looks like suede or raw silk and that's what I use as my foundation. But I love color too. I have a tribal palette. I use a lot of fabrics from Africa, incorporated with my own fabrics, but I also, I have a very bright palette. So my stuff is pretty happy when people buy my work and I ask them if they still love it. <laughs> 50 shades of blue. <laughs> uh, 50, shades. 50 shades of every color, not just green. I'm curious what the first eight colors were that you worked with. Uh, I don't remember because I bought all of a hundred now, but um, there was like a, their potion, their powder dyes you buy, and I took a class, and there were 30 people in the class, because I, I thought I really need, I tried to buy fabric solids, I was more drawn to solid fabrics, I, I'm in denial that I'm a quilter, but it is a nod to it, and I have made some quilts, but when people ask me if I'm a quilter, oh I love your quilts. It's not really describing what I'm doing. So I call it textile collage, but definitely it's where I came from and I like the structure. Uh, but the eight colors, I think, you know, there was like a bright yellow, black, um, probably red, and a shade of blue. Uh, but you can mix so many colors from, you know, any colors. So I started with eight, and so this class that I took was some women who, um, were dyeing fabric before anyone else really was, and they were leaving their business behind and they wanted to share it with people. So my sister and I both took the class. There were 30 people in the class. Everyone had a different color study to do every hour. You had to make 30 sheets of your little pieces of color to give everybody. So we all left with this huge recipe book. It was fabulous. So I refer to that. I make my own colors too. So it's cotton muslin. But just a good cotton. I do, I started initially doing just solids because I like traditional Amish quilts which I think are super modern and beautiful and um, I wanted solids. They were so flat at stores that I went to shopping for fabric that I really thought I need something personal and I need to make my own color palette because the palette is part of my art, is, you know, when you make your own colors. Um, so I do travel a lot though, so my, I've got kind of a world story as well. I've, all, I've incorporated saris that I bought in India and scarves that I bought in Bangkok. I lived in Japan years ago and I have a lot of kimonos, so I cut these fabrics up. I buy them because I love looking at them. I stuff my suitcase with saris and whatever, wherever I am. And I know I love it, so I'm going to enjoy looking at it and I'm eventually going to cut it up and share it in my art, through my art. So there's saris with hand stitching um, that really inspired me to start stitching. So if you see my other work, this is entirely hand stitched down. I'm also dyeing my threads that I use to hand stitch them down. So it's really personal, simple shapes, but I feel they're kind of luscious. And what I want people to take away with them is that when they see it in their space, it makes them happy every time they look at it. So Aileen, I'm going to go get your painting, and I think it's amazing how you first start with just the torn paper magazine, and you lay out your entire composition and kind of the, the foundation of it, yet then you go back in with paint and make it even more intricate. So tell us about how you use the different layers and how long does it take you to tear up all the paper? <laughs> I don't know that I want to think about that. Um, it, it, it does take quite a while for me to find the paper. Uh, I'm flipping through piles of magazines looking for just the right colors that match the photo that I'm recreating. 
And so um, all of my artwork's based on my photography. Um, and I photograph things that I see that I think are beautiful, which most people may not look at ordinary life being that amazing. But when you stop and actually look at what's happening around you, I, I think life is amazing. Um, so, so that's what I love to capture. So there, there was a gentleman walking around um, at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. And the, the building at the Palace of Fine Arts is just so beautiful and heart-stopping. So <clears throat> I start out and I'll sketch out my subject matter based on the photo that I've taken. And then I start going through piles of magazines looking for just the right greens or the beiges or the sky color. Um, and then I tear looking at either the patterns or the color and, and the way the building is formed um, so that everything makes sense, so that every edge has an edge. So each, each plane of the face has an edge. Um, and that's why a lot of times a lot of people will look at my work and think that it looks 3D or more dimensional or it looks like you can walk right into it because it, it does have that textural point. Yeah, and the building looks like it's really constructed. Um, and then I, so once the collage is all done, I paint and I paint on top of it with oil. Now a lot of the color is already there, but I just enhance it. And I, and I paint in a way that you can still see the collage. I mean, if there's advertising, I'll cover it up. Um, and if there's things that aren't interesting, I'll cover it up. But I've spent hours, if not days, and four weeks collaging. So I don't want to cover up everything. I really want to just enhance what I already have. <laughs> in the text that re relate to the painting, like the nature of things, because it's a nature piece. And that's probably very, um, very thoughtful in your process. Yes. It, so when I do leave words in, a lot of times when I'm collaging, um, I don't edit. I, I trust my gut. Like, it's very intuitive as far as what I'm putting in. Even if, in, in, when I'm thinking about it rationally, it doesn't make sense. I've realized through my process, I have to trust my intuition. Um, because the right person will come to me and tell me a story, and the, the, it's either the word or the image makes so much sense to them, and the piece is meant to go to that person. And, and I'm just creating it. And so I'm just a, fil like, I'm just a filter. And so um, like that piece in particular, in text, it says you in mind. And my titles always come from text that I find within a piece. And the more I thought about this piece, the more I thought, here's this gentleman walking down this path. Now this path has flowers all down the path. And, and I didn't title the piece until after I was finished. But that piece completely has to do with that. He's reading a letter. I don't know who the letter is from, who it's to. And I just realized recently um, in text, It says, examine the relationship between man and man. And I'm like, oh, that, it just fits perfectly. And I, I like how it comes together as a puzzle. And I like how it tells the story. And I like that I'm part of it, but I'm not forcing it. That's great. That's great. <laughs> always the, the next thought that you think you should share that's like, they have that. So awesome. I love that. So, um, Kathy, you do not just cement, but you also do the, the encaustic type covering. But um, you're, when I look at your work, I see color and I see composition and storytelling and how all that comes together with your techniques. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, this one, in, no, I am 50 Shades of Gray here. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, I do like my grays. And even though I specialize in color, I really love beautiful muted palettes. This this one in particular basically is when I was a kid, um, I loved birch trees. Loved trees. 
I'd always notice like the markings on trees. But I didn't, I didn't want to paint trees. I was one of those kids where if I saw a tree, it wasn't a tree. It was shapes and markings. And so I've always thought kind of abstractly. And I remember when I first started painting, I tried to paint realistic. It just didn't work for me because that's not how I think. It's, it's the forms and the shapes and the, the writings and, and the markings that I see. So this is my tree because it's just little snippets of little, little markings that I see on trees when I am, you know, back home or um, out in California, just and kind of arranged in more of a contemporary form. I do paint with color. I, I love color, but I tend to choose colors that are a little bit, um, I might say grayed out. Um, I, don't like, I don't like primary colors. In fact, just the other day I was, um, just this fall I was trying, I was looking at some de Kooning paintings and I just loved how he used like pinks and fuchsias with golds and I was like, wow, those are really yummy colors. And then there's this other artist also in New York that uses a lot of paint. His name's Gary Colmer, and he's a contemporary painting, painter. And I thought, I'm going to paint a pink painting, or a fuchsia. And so I spent like a month trying to be friends with pink. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> Aren't you um, the one that your bedroom was pink when you were a kid and you hated yes, it? Yes, yes. Okay. My mom painted my walls pink, and she hand, my mom's an artist, a watercolor artist, with big daisies everywhere. I don't know, maybe that has some, I don't know. I just cannot paint with pink, and yet I look at other people's art with pink and I love it. So I think we all have our innate sense of color, our sensibility, and and how it makes us feel. And I think that links to color psychology, which I was trained in. Um, just a little side note, um, I definitely am more of an introvert. And there is um, colors that connect to our personalities. I definitely, when I walk into someone's house, I can tell whether there's two introverts or maybe there's, maybe an, we're all both obviously extrovert and introvert but I can usually tell by the colors that they choose and how their art is. I can usually tell what sort of personality they are just based on what they choose. So with that being said, um, my house is pretty much grays and taupes and creams and blacks. <laughs> I like very subtle subtleties and then I'll put the color in the walls or in the uh, art and that is very true it's like I always say introverted people more introverted people actually they they tend to like Sedona whereas extroverted people like uh, Las Vegas so <laughs> <laughs> so I have a very little La Las Vegas in me and a lot of Sedona so, um, but yeah, so I, I do use color. It just tends to be always tempered, always, I always have a grounding color with it. So whether that be browns or taupes or grays, I think that it really gives you a quiet resting spot for the art when you introduce color. It, 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 it kind of makes it interesting because it makes your, your eye move around and not focus just on the color but it brings you around the painting when you have some sort of resting point. So. Very, very well said. Okay, Mel, I want to hear more about how you choose. I know you don't plan it ahead, but it, how does this evolve? And then maybe a little bit about expanding on collaborations. Well, for me, it's just real playful. I mean, it's shape quite a number of times, but it's always different. Um, 
So, you know, I just get going and there it goes. <laughs> and then the top makes it really fun. And I play with color. I try to graduate a little bit and then I do a bold change of color. And it's real fun to work with the willow as a framework because it's just so fluid and flexible. And um, there's just so many things. There's just, it's just unlimited what you could do with color. I mean, the colors are unlimited, but also shape is. And, and that's just really fun. Now, I did this one. Bill didn't actually help me on this one. But he's working on some at home, very similar. And so we have a lot of uh, things we do that are similar. Um, you know, we copy each other. <laughs> if he's got some good color combinations, I'll, I'll use those. And, you, and so you can hardly tell the difference in the work. But I tend to do the finishings and mostly the beginnings. And he has the patience to do often the very large pieces that you see on the wall. And, um, you know, because he'll take time. I, I'm flying. And I want to, my mind is already on the next one. You do work fast. I'm a zoomer. Are you yeah. an extrovert or introvert? I like Sedona. I'm told by you won't find me in bed ever. <laughs> okay. I don't know what. <laughs> I think she's a brilliantly bright introvert. So I have watched Mel a lot, but one thing I'm always amazed at is how you graduation. So can you talk about how does this happen? Do you start leaving things off? Well, it's, it's the layering. So I start at the bottom and I'm working this heavier fiber. It's a very thick reed and that's to gain control of those willows because they aren't in control. They're wild. And then um, I come up and create this wedge and I'm tying it all to the side with the shoestring. And then um, <laughs> And then I create a wedge to lock that bun in, and then a band, and then I swing it the other way. And see, I swing it this way, and then I swing it this way. And but this this uh, little textural sisal, uh, it's just a twisted sisal that I've dyed green. It's just layered on right after this band because it needed that there. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> What went away? Oh, oh, um, I'm turning. I, I, I'm using a single weaver as opposed to right through here. I'm using three at a time. And on this edge, I just get started and I make a series of turns. So I've turned here and here. So I go around and turn and come around and turn. And it's really just building a wedge. And here, if I get tired of weaving, I leave windows. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, but exactly, and then and yet that that's what you really want is a negative space too. So it just it's all just for fun, and I love the satisfaction upon completion. That's what hooks me in. Is that I'm so happy when it's done and it's perfect. It's a Santa Fe chicken. <laughs> Bill named it. He came up with it. I was initially appalled when he did that, when he started this up, and then they kept selling, so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll join you. I can do that. What is the largest um, diameter of a wall piece that you've done, and the tallest basket? Oh, I think over six feet. I've had to, that's a good question, I'm not quite sure. I worked them off a ladder um, and, and worked down. I wish I had something like that here this time, but I don't. And the biggest wall piece was uh, a good 12 feet and 4 feet wide because that's the limit of our trailer. You know? <laughs> that's, all we, that's all we can fit. And this would be not good to like tie on the top. It would be a little not like good. a sail. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you recently... Um, have done a few collaborations with another one of our mm -hmm. celebration artists. Can you talk about yeah. like, what attracted you guys? To yeah, well, them? Vicki had the idea. Vicki Grant is the ceramic artist. She's not here right now, but she's in the back corner. 
and uh, she's got a fabulous display. And she does these wonderful circular ceramic pieces, and she's always tried to, well, not always, but in the last few years, trying to get me to think about collaborating. And it took me a while, and then it just really clicked last year. And those pieces were on the wall, I really briefly. But they were big. They were 50 inches, uh, big circles, and we had a couple there this year, and, a, and even a smaller one. So. We'll see, we're going to do some more fun stuff, maybe some odd shapes. And it's interesting combining the, the ceramic, which is more of a hard surface, mm -hmm. with the more soft. Yeah, and something about our palette and the textures, they, they don't really fight each other. They seem to really work. Um, I thought it might be uh, sensory overload, you know, looking at them. But if I try to keep my palette soft up against hers and then get busier outward from that, then it, plays off of that, and it's not um, exhausting to look at it. I think they look great. Yeah, I think that's really, I, I, we love watching these artists that collaborate together and elevate each other to new heights. And the, the incubation of the ideas here is pretty amazing. Mimi? Kathleen and I did a collaboration last year. She had a couch. She had a couch <laughs> and a beautiful cement painting, and I put a pillow on the couch. <laughs> yeah. And then I took it home, and I had it she on. Still have yes, I still have it. I forgot to return it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how convenient! Convenient. Um, so you you were asking where I'm getting the idea that maybe you were interested in. Caustic, it's 
I don't know if you're familiar with encaustic, but it's basically beeswax mis mixed with uh, Damar resin. The Damar is what makes it hard. Well, after using it for about a year and a half, I got really sick. I, I didn't know what was happening. Um, I thought it was maybe food because I am sensitive to everything. So it wasn't. It was actually the Damar resin. Damar resin comes from a tree. It's actually an oil paint as well. And it may, it's what makes it hard. I could not use wax and I was like, what am I going to do? Because I knew and I loved that waxy look. So I had to quit working with encaustic completely, but I wanted that look to, to just overglaze my paintings. And I, I experimented with a lot of products and finally figured out how to get that waxy look I, I wanted, but it's actually acrylic. So, but if you feel it, it feels very waxy. There's always, always problem solving that goes on behind any creative endeavor. Um, and you kind of touched on it in the beginning, but how long did you test your cement colors out in the sun to make sure that there were and, and I, I'll tell you, we have a Kathleen Hope that hangs on in our front courtyard. So when you come in, it's to the left of the front door. And it's just, it makes me happy. Every time I open the gate and I see our Kathleen Hope piece, and I've, we've got a metal and glass piece in front of it. And um, it has not changed color one iota since we hung it up, like, I don't know, two or three years ago. So how did you do that? So um, basically, um, what I, what I use is, uh, for my outdoor pieces is a hardy backer board, which is meant to put tile on. So it's like a half inch uh, hardy board. It does not work. You know, water or anything gets on it. And then again, I overlay it with many layers of cement. I build up a base. And then, then I create the designs. Now, I have to use a little bit different mix. I use more cement than than I do actually with my indoor pieces. Um, but, and, and I, actually the colorants that I use uh, are also different. So because I, I have a background in, in color, and I, and I actually used to work with architects uh, doing old Victorian houses, I actually would be the person that would be uh, picking out the 12 colors uh, for the, the exterior. So I know what, I have a, a, a very knowledge of, of exterior uh, products and how they fade. And in fact, um, one of the best uh, places that they use a product, it's called Theme Paint, is actually at Disney World. And uh, they use this paint made by Modern Masters. It's a really based paint that really, really holds up like strong, saturated colors. So I use that, but I also use mostly cement, uh, concrete stains and dyes. And then I seal it many, many coats with the best sealer that you can buy basically for concrete. They seal pavers with it. And it, I, I think the one client that I have bought my first painting nine years ago, they have it in partial sun here, nothing has changed. Now you have to take in consideration that, you know, a lot of times when see cement and they color the cement. You know, that's getting walked on and, you know, rained on and dirt and things are scratching it. Well, with my sealant and the colors that I use, I also put it in a steel frame. You know, it just, it, it's not getting really any, um, any scratching or anything like that except for just the sun. So I have nine years of proof that it, it, there's very little that changes. Very good. What does it mean if somebody's favorite color is blue, like every shade of blue? What does that say about a person? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, color is always in, in, in the context. Color and meaning is always in the context. So uh, blue tends to be uh, a very trustworthy, they say it, a very trustworthy color. Um, but it also can mean, um, you know, it also, also can refer to um, ocean and, and uh, peace, peacefulness. And so, like I say, it's always in the context. 
So I always give the reference, like, you know, when you're on a, on a flight, um, you, the reason that they wear, usually Navy, most of the flight attendants, is for that reason. Um, you wouldn't want them wearing red. Uh, so it's, like I say, it's always in the context. And I love blue. Blue is one of my favorite colors. Uh, oh, yeah. I think for me, it's because I, blue has so much variation. There's so many variations of blue. And, and I love, here I live in Arizona, I love the ocean. Love being by the ocean. Um, so that's part of it for me. I, I love you know, being in the Bahamas. And, and so blue is, is, like I say, content. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Mimi, you talked about your travels. How has your going to places like Thailand and that inspired you? And what is it mainly about those places that you remember and you want to bring back in your fabric? Good question. And by the way, Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> totally Vegas. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> um, the you know, the travels are for my soul. I love traveling. And every time I travel, I I take a cooking class of some sort so I can bring back recipes and have dinner parties. That's one of my souvenirs. And then, honestly, I just really started collecting fabrics in the last 10 years while I was traveling. I've always been drawn to scarves and things, but um, I've been using my solid fabrics for so many years, which I loved. And I thought were pretty modern and simple shapes. Uh, but there's so much color. I've been to India twice, and the first time I saw saffron and Reds and rich colors, and the flowers and the people and the smells. It's all good. Um, and the second time I went, I saw more earth tones. I was more in the country and uh, rural areas. And so um, the fabrics, I mean, I love fabric. I always get back to fabric. And I, I told my sister, I called her recently, I said, I still like sewing. I still like sitting down on my machine and sewing. But the fabrics are so beautiful, and the hand stitching really, you know, spoke to me. Um, but again, I brought fabrics back because I love them myself, and I eventually wanted to use them in my work. Um, I was inspired by, you know, the telephone poles that were crooked, and um, you know, I do lines and circles and squares, so they're everywhere. So I'm completely inspired by everything around me too, because I see beauty everywhere, and I sketch. But mostly it's in my head. I mean, they're not, they're simple shapes, but um, I have a funny story. I, I made a piece um, in lines that was inspired by a stone from Italy. I was on a beach there reading a book <laughs> I, in my clothes because I don't really love the beach. <laughs> but we were sitting on these beautiful, smooth black stones. But a lot of them had lines in them, and I took a handful home. I always carry heavy things home, rocks and stones and all kinds of heavy things, billiard balls. <laughs> They're pretty. And I put them in a basket and look at them. Um, but I brought these stones back and I made a piece because I was looking at one side and it had these lines and I thought that's a really beautiful composition. And I made a piece in my solid fabric with these lines and I sold it to someone at an art show in Kansas City years ago. And they said, you know, we really want a companion piece. And I thought, I'm not sure, I, I'll do another line piece, probably. And I was in my studio and I flipped the rock over. And that was the design. It was similar and it was connected, but it was different. And I actually, the person asked me what you know my inspiration was. I'm like, it was the other side of the rock. And I gave it to them because that was their two art pieces. So, I mean, you know, there's inspiration everywhere. Um, but going to foreign countries, I mean, I like learning and for me, connecting with the people, and I do buy vintage fabrics too, so some of the old saris I bought, there's a story there, there's history, layers of history, and I feel really honored to take these fabrics and these, these things that have lived somewhere else and incorporate them into my work and share that. Okay, tell us how we care for your beautiful works of art when we take them home so that they are preserved the best manner. Um, well, I used to frame them under glass, plexiglass. This is a new framing style for me. Um, 
you don't want to put them in direct sunlight because they are textiles, but I will say I've had some pieces that I had in the sun for years and they faded beautifully. It's almost like an antique. They're beautiful. So they will hold up and I do guarantee them. If I still have some of the fabrics and it's really bad, but don't put it in sunlight um, unless you want to use um, the protective UV glass. Um, but I, I think that changes the color for me. You know, I'm a colorist as we all are and they're a little foggy and brown so I don't particularly care for it. Um, I'm doing them all open now. I sold a bunch of pieces open and I think people like to see the texture and I think the colors are more vibrant. I would say just don't hang them in direct sun but they're meant to be looked at and used and they, uh, I haven't had dusty, I will give you a can of air with each piece um, <laughs> because I can get them at a good price. Um, but I, so I did the, after construction here, um, there was a little bit of dust in these new open frames and I did the air and I haven't gotten any more since because we aren't really constructing and sawing and doing sanding here. Um, and yeah, maybe a duster, you know, I've, I've accident, I've, I've flung food on a piece accidentally once and uh, I couldn't find it later. Yeah, but they're fine and they're, they're pretty durable. I'll give you a can of air. <laughs> I like that. I think that's going to be my new dusting technique. <laughs> and I have a, a friend who is a quilter and has made me some beautiful quilts, and I used to be afraid to use them, and, you know, I put them away, did what the cats to sit on them. Like, they're meant to be used, but, you know, wash them, and they should be cozy. So they've become one of my favorite things. So um, I'm going to go back to Aileen, and then we'll open up to some questions that from all of you. But Aileen, I, to me... And all of you, your pieces all tell a story, but uh, of all of you today on this panel, your pieces really have that story and the, the, the tug at your heart or the bring back a memory. How, how important is that in your way of connecting with people? Well, the story, um, a lot of times when I approach a painting, I don't have a story in mind. And, and, and through like, what I was talking about before, through the text, I learned the story, and actually, um, there was a piece that I did recently, and usually I am working off my own photography, but it was a friend's piece, and I was doing it for a show, and the theme of the show was man plus nature, and it was a, a painting of a girl walking through the woods, and in text, I always find my titles, and so I had asked my friend, can I use this picture, I really want to do this painting, it's photo, and in text it said, come through. I, I, I titled the piece, come through, because she's walking through the woods, and it turns at the end of the path, and there's this bright light. And as I'm painting it, I'm really sad. And I don't understand why I'm so sad. But then, when I finished the piece, I got it. Um, this was his girlfriend at the time, and they had broken up, and she was walking away from him. And so I titled the piece, now, I didn't know this while I was doing the collage, but I surely knew this afterwards. This is where my intuition comes in. And all the words had to do with her leaving. And at the end of the path, I found this piece of collage, and it was, it looked like a rock, but it was the face of a lion, and he was encrusted in some green moss. And it fit perfectly, but it changed the tone of the piece. I'm like, this goes from happy to a little bit, like, heart-wrenching. And I questioned it for a long time, but I knew intuitively that I should put it there, so I put it there. And I can tell you, every person that has seen this painting since is connected with it for that reason. Um, and it's all about staying strong. Like, I looked up the meaning of what a lion represents, and it's staying strong to your horse. And, and, like, and she was leaving it. They had been dating for years. And it was just, it was amazing. And, and what's ironic is I told him, you know, I'll give you a <laughs> and after I got done, like it was, it was really hard for me to paint it. It was very sad for me to paint it. But when I, I messaged him, he's like, "Oh no, I want it." I'm like, "Are you sure you want a copy of this piece?" Because I knew they were broken up. And he wanted it, but yeah, I love that. Did that give anyone else goosebumps? Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, I knew it would. You, my sister. So, uh, do we have questions from any of you that you'd like to ask us? Kathy? Right, 
to Are you put... using any tools besides your hands? No. Um, you know, I have a clipper, a fine clipper, and then a, a stick clipper, a little bigger, like a pruner. And those beads, um, the brass beads, I actually, they have a big enough hole that I thread on with, on, when I'm on that path, that one layer. I can stick them on each, uh, each stitch or every other stitch. And the other ones are sewn on either after or like the turquoise ones down below. I kind of sew them on when I can still get my hand down in there. And it's just because it needed a little something there. You know, it needed contrast or it needed just, just ask for something. <laughs> The, um, those brass ones do pretty good size holes, so I can thread it right on. Yeah, very cool. They all listen to their art. Their art tells them what to do. Any other questions for the ladies today? No, Wendy. Thank you for being here.